Welcome, everybody. This is Governing Pandemics 101, Session 3, Treaties as a Tool to Govern Pandemics. I'm Dr. Katarina Kummer Perry. I'm the director of Kummer Eco Consult in Switzerland and the former executive secretary of the Basel Convention on Hazardous Waste. Uh, my speciality is essentially international uh, environmental law. I would like to uh, give a brief introduction to treaties, options, effectiveness, and lessons. And just to clarify first, I would like to speak about multilateral treaties. So treaties that are adhered to by more than two states. You also have bilateral treaties where only two states are parties. Uh, those are not subject of today. And also global treaties, those that are open to all states of the world. So not limited to a specific region or a specific group of countries. So uh, first of all, uh, very briefly, what is a multilateral treaty and how does it work? In a nutshell, of course, there are much more complex definitions than this, but in a nutshell, a treaty is an international legal instrument that creates binding obligations on its parties. So states that are parties to it have to uh, abide by the obligations. The purpose of a global treaty is generally to ad address a global problem, a problem that affects the whole world, uh, and a problem that requires concerted action by all states, where uh, individual measures or different measures by different states or some states doing nothing at all is not sufficient, uh, requiring global concerted action. A very uh, common example or um, the very um, well-known example of this is climate change that everybody will be familiar with. Uh, so just to highlight a few characteristics, of a global treaty. It is generally negotiated through um, an intergovernmental process, a negotiation process that is open-ended, so every state in the world can participate. Uh, and it is quite often hosted by an international organization. For example, the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the negotiation process for this treaty was hosted by WHO. Following the conclusion of the negotiation process, there, uh, uh, the next step is adoption of the treaty by a, uh, quite often by a diplomatic conference convened for this purpose. So it's a formal process by which uh, a conference adopts the treaty. Following this, uh, states can become parties, so decide to be um, bound by the obligations of the treaty through a formal process, either a signature followed by ratification, a two-step process, or uh, accession. And for uh, just to simplify uh, in the, as we go on, I will refer to ratification, meaning all of these. Every treaty specifies a number of states that have had that have had to ratify the treaty for it to enter into force. So it can be 50, it can be 20, it can be 30. This is specified in every treaty. After that number of states have ratified, the treaty enters into force and becomes binding international law. Just to mention briefly the distinction between a treaty and a so-called soft law instrument, such as a declaration, a resolution, a plan of action. Such in instruments usually express commitment to a cause or calls for action, but they are not binding. They do not have, and not have legally binding character. Uh, this does not mean, of course, that they are um, not important uh, or not efficient. Uh, for example, the UN General Assembly resolution that set out 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals is a soft law instrument, and as everybody knows, uh, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are very widely embraced and used throughout the world. Different terms are used for a treaty. Uh, these are mostly used interchangeably. The most common ones are convention, agreement. There are also some older ones like pact uh, that have been used in the past. Uh, these, at least in terms of international law, mean the same thing. They're interchangeably. And then you have treaties that are known as protocols, which means that they are uh, legally and substantively linked to a parent treaty. Now, a quick look at the relationship between a treaty and national law. As mentioned, uh, a treaty sets out 
obligations to a state that is a party to it. And the example here, uh, we have the Minamata Convention on Mercury. So the treaty obliges the state to um, reduce or control mercury exports, just as, as an example. The state then has to implement this through enacting national legislation, normally through a parliamentary process. And that national legislation then becomes binding on the individual, the, the, the companies, the persons within the state. The treaty, normally, there are a few exceptions to this, but we'll not go into those normally. It's binding on the state and not on the individual. The content of a treaty is obviously different uh, in accordance with the substance, with the objective. So it sets out measures that the states have to take. And in addition, many treaties also have, uh, or most modern treaties have also um, obligations that are designed to facilitate implementation and enha enhance effectiveness. Uh, a very common way of doing this is to include obligations for international cooperation, for information exchange, uh, for technical and financial assistance to developing countries, which does not directly um, address the substance, but is a means of making the treaty more effective. Uh, some treaties go, go into more details on this. For example, uh, an obligation to notify incidents, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, for example, how does this. An obligation to cooperate on early warning system and emergency preparedness. Paris Agreement on Climate Change is an example. Uh, and there are a few others uh, like this. So you have the concrete measures uh, related to the subject, and then these measures that enhance cooperation. Institutions of the treaty, modern global treaties, are no longer as used to be uh, in times past, a piece of paper with obligations of states written on them. Uh, there's actually a whole institutional infrastructure that is designed mm -hmm. to make the treaty work. This differs, of course, from one treaty to the next, but a fairly typical example would be uh, the one you see there on the slide. Uh, there is the Conference of the Parties, which is the supreme organ of the treaty, composed of all parties, also known as the COP. Uh, you might be familiar with this from the discussions on climate change, where the COPs are usually very present in the media. Uh, the COP takes all decision in relation to the treaty, including the budget, the work plan, work program, the scale of assessments for contributions by parties. The COP can also adopt amendments to the treaty and can adopt protocols uh, on specific substances. Uh, and it can uh, adopt things like non-binding guidelines and work plans, etc. cetera. Uh, many treaties then have subsidiary bodies which are established by the COP and uh, operating under its authority. Uh, and these are usually specialist bodies, mandate composed quite often of experts on a certain issue, uh, mandated to address specific issues like scientific research, so a scientific advisory body, uh, technical assistance, uh, compliance, could be verification. There are several um, tasks that, that can be given to such bodies. The Bureau is a sort of uh, an executive body uh, that manages the treaty work in between the sessions of the COP. And then you have the Secretariat, which is an entity composed of paid individuals, uh, usually employees of a hosting organization, that have the task to um, manage the work, prepare uh, the meetings of the COP and the subsidiary bodies, and service the meetings uh, of these bodies, and then carry out other tasks such as compile information, studies, projects, etc. Uh, and finally, some treaties feature a financial mechanism, uh, which is an international body that supports or funds projects in eligible countries in relation to the objective of the, of the treaty. These are mostly developing countries. The financial mechanism can be a subsidiary body of the treaty, or it can be an independent body. This differs. There, both um, models exist. A few words on ensuring compliance, and there I would like to say at the outset that there is no international police force. Uh, this is something that quite often shocks uh, students when they hear about this for the first time. Uh, there, there isn't the same um, mechanism as you have at the national level where uh, the obligations can actually be enforced and sanctions imposed for non-compliance. The reason for this is that traditionally uh, states have been very reluctant 
uh, to give such powers to an international body uh, as they feel this would be um, an infringement of national sovereignty. And for this re reason, most compliance mechanisms have an advisory role uh, and, and are voluntary, which doesn't not necessarily mean they're ineffective. Uh, their, their work can lead to significant political pr uh, pressure for, on states that are not in compliance, uh, often aided by NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and the media. A few examples of compliance monitoring methods and mechanisms that exist. Uh, a very simple and very widespread one is an obligation uh, to all states, parties, uh, to provide national reports on their performance to the conference of the parties or to a subsidiary body, which then assesses uh, performance um, and again operates through a certain political pressure on states that have not complied or failed to submit their reports as well. Another model is a subsidiary body, as already mentioned, uh, that is mandated to discuss allegations of non-compliance and propose possible solutions, again, uh, without power to impose sanctions. Then some treaties have stronger mechanisms. Um, one is verification, a process by which uh, a treaty body, a subsidiary body again, uh, actually assesses, actively assesses individual compliance by states. Uh, you have this, for example, in the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. And finally, um, there are more, these are just a few examples, important examples. Uh, inspection, you find this in fisheries treaties or treaties on marine pollution, where a subsidiary body or even other party states uh, have the right and the authority to inspect vessels by other parties. Finally, uh, and I think this gets me to the lessons part of the presentation, a few words on factors of success uh, or failure of success on treaties. Obviously, there are very many factors that contribute to uh, whether a treaty is successful or not. Uh, I would just like to, hi to highlight a few of them. And uh, for this purpose, um, mention as an example, the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. Because first, it's the only United Nations treaty so far to have achieved universal ratification. So all 198 states, members to the UN, are parties to the Montreal Protocol. And secondly, it is well on the way to solve the problem that it has set out to address. Uh, that is to say, the ozone layer is projected to recover by the middle of this century. A few reasons for this success, and here I think we could, might come to the lessons learned. Some of these might be relevant for a possible future pandemics treaty, for other treaties. Uh, these reasons are present in the Montreal Protocol, but also in others. Um, one of these reasons is uh, the problem being understand easily understandable to everybody. So everybody understands uh, what the problem is. Everybody understands that the problem is serious. Uh, not only scientists, but the man and woman on the street, essentially. Uh, in this case, it was uh, de the depletion of the ozone layer being linked to skin cancer. Everybody knows what that means, and everybody uh, knows it's dangerous and, and hazardous. Uh, this enhances the possibility of success and, uh, and support for the treaty. Another one is that if the treaty addresses a problem that affects all countries of the world, so not just specific regions such as, say, for example, desertification, but all countries of the world, specifically also powerful countries and countries that are normally reluctant to support international treaties, um, dangerous for everybody. Then very important, in my opinion, the availability of technical so solutions. This was also the case in, uh, the, with the Montreal Protocol. During the negotiations, alternative substances became available that were less dangerous to the ozone layer. Uh, and these provided uh, opportunities for industry to develop this, the substances with financial gain. There was the emergence of a market. So the problem could be solved uh, quite easily, and it was even uh, financially viable for industry. And a final one, not really a final one, there are more, but these are the main ones I would like to mention. Uh, is the, the uh, existence of a financial mechanism, as mentioned earlier. Parties can apply to for funding projects uh, and for funding measures uh, to support them in their work to develop the treaty. 
Obviously, the absence of all these mechanisms uh, make a treaty less successful, and there are actually a few examples um, in international law where treaties were negotiated, but due to absence of factors that would have made, would have made them successful, actually never entered into force. This is also uh, leads, of course, to, to a lack of success. So this might be some food for thought uh, in, um, in advance of the next presentation that will be specifically uh, addressing the pandemic treaty.